Welcome to the Integral Stage and to another episode of our Meta Model series. Today we're joined by Lex Neal, the creator of the Aqua Cube and author of Knowing the Knower. Of the people we've spoken with so far, Lex is probably one of the only ones who's had his work publicly recognized and promoted by Ken Wilber. Um, so welcome, Lex. Um, are there any introductory remarks you'd like to make, Layman, before we get started with the interview? Well, just that I'm thrilled to have him here. Uh, I've been following the evolution of Lex's approach for years. And, you know, taking the Aquil Square up to a cube seems like such an obvious and powerful move that opens up a lot of possibilities. But I'm also aware that a lot of people are not clear on what the hell he's describing or what's implied by his wording as your commentary. So I'm looking forward to probing this integral meta theory in a way that helps people get a better sense of what exactly Lex's vision is. I'm excited. Great, great. Looking forward to that. And again, welcome, Lex. And Thank so you. I'd like, yeah, yeah, didn't mean to cut you off there, but <laughs> yeah, I'd like to um, just start with uh, an open question. We, I, I like to start with the biographical in a sense. And how did you get started in integrative studies in general and also in meta modeling? Did it begin earlier in your life or was it an inspiration that arose later? And what was the initial inspiration for your Aqua Cube? What, what first set that ball rolling? Uh, it does go a long way back. Um, I, I did uh, zoology and psychology, um, you know, back in the 60s. And uh, my bachelor's thesis was on the origin of life. And life at that time meant all these amazing uh, discoveries they were finding in the depths of the oceans, you know, these volcanic vents, uh, all these uh, unknown organisms clustered around them, thriving away at thousands of feet down. And uh, this was considered to be the new origin of life. This is the big deal. And my thesis was the origin of life is consciousness. And that really threw a, a wrench into the works. It was like, uh, what the heck? I started off with what the heck is he talking about? And I guess I'm still carrying on with what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so in, in my uh, early uh, biological studies, uh, I was very fascinated by biorhythms and uh, how organisms basically were regulated by them, how they lived their lives by these biorhythms. And nearly all the biorhythms are to do with the movements of the sun and moon in relation to the earth. Uh, all earth's organisms are basically geared to those cycles, but those cycles are very, very complex. And as a result, uh, biorhythms are uh, very complex. And there are eight main biorhythms, which fascinated me. And um, I was cooking up already a model of how does an organism relate to the world? Uh, how do, even just a single cell organism, how, how does it establish its identity and figure things out? that it survives and goes after mates and goes after food and, uh, and all this. And uh, I already realized back then that there were a fundamental uh, perspectives that any, anything, any sentient thing had to take, no, no ex uh, exemptions. And these were a sense of interior and a sense of exterior a sense of being alone and a sense of being uh, uh, with your buddies. And that's as far as the four quadrants basically take it. But there is a third uh, factor, a third polarity that's really been uh, um, in hiding in plain sight, which is um, the actual experience uh, of these four variables and the experience of these four variables, two different things, an experience and an experience. And basically, it get, I'm not a philosopher, so please don't lead me up any philosophical path because it's a jungle for me. But one thing uh, I did know 
was that um, uh, the epistemics and the ontologics, uh, that fundamental polarity forms the basis of the experiencer and the experience. Uh, uh, it's our epistemic and ontologic uh, uh, orientation, basically. So that through the four quadrants, which I wasn't aware of at the time, uh, into eight uh, perspective, perspectives. Uh, in the three axes uh, generate eight perspectives uh, as opposed to four with two. So I realized that the eight fundamental perspectives were linked to those biorhythms, those eight main biorhythms. And the way biorhythms work is that the, the, the larger the cycles, the more inclusion there is of, uh, the, uh, of others. Because a bigger cycle like, a, like going for, from uh, winter to spring, it involves a massive shift, not just an individual shift, but a massive shift. All the birds start feeling what they're getting jittery and they're, they're wanting to get to their migration route. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, but the smaller cycles, the tiny little cycles, which is like, a, say, a diurnal cycle, 24 hour, those are, are more individually um, experienced. They affect the individuals rather than affecting the whole community. So um, I basically, uh, in my book, um, I basically talked about those uh, eight biorhythms and how they became established in uh, very simple organisms and how really Ken's four quadrants emerging from point zero is uh, uh, although it's a, a, an octodynamic, nevertheless, it, 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 those eight biorhythms fit into the four quadrants as well. It doesn't really matter, but they are, it's almost like a fractal. The, the eight keeps coming up all the time uh, in nature, in physics. Um, it, it's, uh, it's definitely a fractal uh, thing. But what Ken got right and, and when I uh, stumbled across integral theory in uh, 1999, I, uh, I realized straight off that, yeah, he got that right. He got the awareness and the energy. He got the, uh, uh, what he called uh, the intentions and the behaviors, you know what I mean? That was right up my alley, you know, cause I was, all my little organisms have, have lots of intentions, and lots of little behaviors, you know. <laughs> so uh, I hooked into integral theory very easily uh, uh, through that portal, you know. And then a few years later, uh, I was living in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And um, I wrote a paper uh, and I figured, damn, I'm going to take this to the Aqual Journal. It's just up the road, up the I-25, jumped in my car, drove to Boulder, uh, went to the uh, uh, office there and, uh, and gave them my uh, paper. And uh, everybody was sort of busy and I kind of thought, okay, well, that's it, I've done it. And, and I, I left. I, I seem to remember Jeff Saltzman there and I seem to remember... Uh, well, anyway, uh, so a little while later, uh, they called me back and uh, they said, hey, yeah, well, we, we're going to uh, publish this in the Aqual Journal. Thanks. Great. Uh, we've got a conference coming up next year. We, want, we, we feel you're the right guy uh, to do a, a whole thing on uh, Quadrivia. Would you, do, would you do us a thing on Quadrivia for the, for the conference? Uh, and I don't know, it, it was probably a little bit arrogant of me and I should, probably shouldn't have said it. <laughs> but I said, well, there's more, oh, there's more Roman emperors than that. There's also uh, uh, Octavians. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Octavia. <laughs> Not just Quadrivia. <laughs> Well, they quickly uh, lost interest in that. So I find myself going um, to the uh, ITC in uh, 2008. 
uh, without having got a paper done or anything. But uh, I took a whole stack of, of the papers. Oh, yeah, and the Aqual Journal went defunct almost immediately after I, I, uh, they said, yeah, great, we're going to publish it. It suddenly went defunct. That was it, gone, you know. So uh, I took a, a bunch of uh, copies, you know, to the conference and handed them out while I was there. But um, Sean was one of them. Sean, that, I had a connection with Sean, actually, that started back then and, and is still very strong uh, even now. He's one of my, you know, buddies. Um, but, yeah, that's, um, that's basically how, uh, how I got involved with the integral community. It's neat to hear that your background is in thinking about organisms because people come across your uh, integral meta modeling work and it's very geometric and right that's attractive to some people it's very off-putting to other people <laughs> do you do you think simple human geometries are adequate to really model bigger spaces and patterns in the universe because the the organic structures are very seldom squares or cubes or triangles or anything like that is, is there an inherent limit to doing it with simple human geometries or is there something about the universe that makes it fit those geometries? Uh, there's something in the universe that so makes it fit. I mean, um, there's one particular structure, which is a really, really fundamental. It's like uh, in my terminology, it's like 1D. Uh, it, 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 it's uh, subquantum, if you like. Penrose did a lot of work on this thing called a spinner. Uh, have you ever heard of spinners? Well, uh, basically, it's a fundamental uh, wave pattern, wave movement, wave oscillation, uh, which um, uh, through its oscillations causes it to come out of the zero point field into the first subquantum dimension. Uh, and the, they're called fluctuons uh, also. But what a spinner is, is basically a triaxial movement of a wave uh, on three axes, you know, and each, each polarity, uh, uh, set of polarities have uh, positive and negative qualities. So through uh, three sets of polarities, uh, the wave basically uh, assumes its ability to come into form or uh, build forms. And the three main things that it does this through uh, are spin, which is the fundamental movement of uh, energy, amplitude, which is the radius of the spin, and frequency, which is the speed of the spin. So through uh, the speed uh, of the spin, basically everything becomes possible. Now, this is a very, very, very fundamental structure, the root of everything. So, yes, I, Layman, I, I totally do feel that from that uh, emergency, it, it really uh, has laid down a template in a way uh, that everything feels very comfortable adhering to, you know, an innate comfort in, in it, you know. In some of your writings, I've heard you use the phrase third axis injunction. Yes. And that seems to be really a very important uh, concept that you've, you've emphasized as really something that, that needs to be taken up by integral theorists who are relying on the, the two-dimensional aqua map. Yeah, and I'm so happy you mentioned that. Yeah, so I'd like to, if you can, um, explain what you mean by the third axis injunction and assuming you mean more than just imagining a third dimension, but that there's actually something in practice that we do to really apprehend this and, and, um, and then deploy it. Um, yeah. yeah. I'd like, if you can just kind of unpack that for us a little bit. Well, in the, uh, in your uh, language thing, uh, all the uh, categories of pronouns and adjectives and everything like that. There are, there are basically three, again, three axes 
that produce all these uh, different uh, categories and and what I would call the vertical axis, the primary axis, in other words, in language uh, comes out to the who and the what. Now the who uh, is uh, you know identifying a sentience, and the what is uh, identifying uh, uh, an, uh, an object, objective reality in which the sentience moves. Uh, so right there in the root of language, like when we, from the moment we start to try to verbalize our feelings and, and uh, ideas, it's right there too, just like the spinner. The spinner was right down there and then it pops up in language again. And there's another spinner, you know, uh, the who and the what, the, the how and the why, uh, and the space time axis of uh, the when and the where. You see what I mean? It's the same fundamental structure again. Now you imagine formulating language without that vertical axis, without the who and the what. Try, try doing it just on the four quadrants. Uh, and language would be um, basically crippled. And I feel that integral theory is crippled in the same way. You know, uh, uh, like I said before, uh, the vertical axis, the third axis injunction, it's really a plural. It's really, there are so many third axis injunctions uh, depending on the way you're looking at things. The interiors and the exteriors, the um, singulars and the plurals, uh, they, they remain constant, but the, the, the vertical axis always sets the bar, sets the tone for uh, the horizontal axes. And so that is why it's a very complex issue because there's not just one way of looking at the vertical axis, but there is, only one way in a way of looking at the horizontal axes, you know, the, the four quadrant model, you know. So um, what, it, what the result of that is that basically each person uh, assumes control of uh, the vertical axis, that it becomes, um, the who and the what becomes first person, uh, the who and the what becomes second person, the who and the what becomes third person, the who and the what becomes third in person, like the lower right quadrant. But you, you can see how simplistic a language it is that can devise. And I, I asked him about this because, you know, the, uh, well, when I went to the um, ITC in 2008, I bumped into uh, Clint Foos. Now, Clint uh, was actually on the Aqual Journal, uh, and he was there in the editorial meeting. He told me, he, said, he told me what happened in that editorial meeting when they were talking about the paper I dropped off. And uh, he said, you know, um, uh, Ken, uh, when Ken read it, he said, uh, and we, we, we had the meeting and decided, yeah, we're going to publish this. He said, this guy really understands where I'm coming from but he's taking it in a direction, a whole other direction, which is going to be great. So I said to Clint, well, what the heck happened then? <laughs> How come I didn't get massive endorsements coming down from integral heaven? <laughs> and it just so happened that Ken got really sick at the same time. And he basically flaked out of a lot of things. And uh, I was one of them, you know, uh, and he never uh, went back to it. And that was that. There's uh, people who are trying to build big meta models often complain that the theory of everything that's discussed in physics is extraordinarily narrow. They're just trying to combine quantum mechanics and gravity or something like that. And they're not really taking all the dimensions of experience into account, but you can level the reverse criticism as well, which is that these big visions, these big models of the universe, these maps of the maps that we have don't dock well with physics, right? 
yours is a little bit of an exception. How important do you think it is for a good super map to be able to integrate with physics? It's super important. Um, it's super important for it to integrate with uh, every possible thing, category, really. Now, uh, Ken, Ken's model is a, it's a bold attempt, you know, at that, because, um, you know, at least he's got awareness and energy coming from point zero, you know, uh, intention and behavior coming from right from the intersection, uh, ground zero. <clears throat> so that's wonderful. Uh, all the way down, all the way up kind of thing, you know. Uh, and physics alone uh, uh, is uh, um, struggling now uh, because it does have to, it, 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 you see, the new, I should be saying the, the new physics because there's something big that has happened in physics over the last um, 50 years, you know. Uh, ever since Bohm, in fact, really, Bohm blew uh, physics apart, uh, uh, even though, you know, there's a lot of other people help it. He was standing on these shoulders of giants. But, but when he basically said, you know, there, uh, there is an aware universe out there, you know, how... The, then, it, I've, ever since from then, it's been a struggle for physics to um, grapple with that, you know, deal with it, you know. And the only physics that is dealing with it really is the new physics. And it's, um, in other words, it's not Newtonian, Einsteinian physics anymore. Uh, it's very largely Bohmian physics. Uh, and it's all to do with quantum everything, quantum biology, uh, quantum this, quantum that. So physics is in a state of upheaval. They need a model, a good model. Uh, and there's, uh, nothing has shown up yet in their world. I talked to Dean Radin about it. I mean, he's right on the spearhead there uh, um, with noetics, you know. Noetics, what a wonderful, gorgeous science, you know what I mean? So new. And still, they're still trying to figure out how, how basically to devise experiments and all, all this sort of thing, and deal with the observer issue, you know. But um, even Dean coming up with amazing books like Real Magic. Even Dean, like it was shocked by that chart that I threw out there, uh, a spectrum chart showing all the different dimensions and you know all the different uh, uh, things going on uh, uh, on various levels of the spectrum and, and stuff. Even he was shocked that, God, you know, how, how, how can, you, how can you know that this works? And I said, well, hey, I'll tell you what, how. I don't know. I, there's no way that I, I, can, uh, I can do this. But um, it's guys like you who are uh, creating a whole new um, scientific world, and it's called multidimensional science. And I, I said to Dean, you know, well, you know, because you're dealing with no ethics, you, you're, you're basically dealing with an entanglement and, and all this kind of non-physical stuff. It is physical, really, because it's still part of the physical universe, but, but, uh, but intangible. Uh, you're dealing with all this, uh, all this stuff, uh, but heck, other people are dealing with afterlife, scientifically. Incredible experiments uh, uh, that uh, 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 show in various ways the continuity of consciousness that Buddha used to talk about, going off into uh, you know uh, higher dimensions, going off into lower dimensions, where now they're beginning to realize, well, hey, the reason why people can actually levitate uh, and uh, heal. Uh, do healing is because uh, they're tapping into the uh, uh, 2D quantum field 
uh, with uh, quite a good level of awareness and manipulation. So uh, 3D science is now reaching into 2D uh, things that again are out of our spectrum of awareness, but they're there. And so multidimensional science is basically proving all on its own, the, the this aspect of complexity of the universe, you know, of multidimensional existence. As you know, uh, your your work has both been welcomed and resisted in the integral community. And I think one of the sources of resistance has been how closely it is tied, especially to the new quantum physics and quantum consciousness paradigms. And I'm a longtime fan of Bohm and, uh, and, and some of the work that's followed after him. And I keep looking for revindications of Bohm because I think there's really something deep. I think Wilbur maybe prematurely dismissed him. But, you know, understandably, I think if a model, a meta model that's in attempting to encompass, you know, large aspects of reality and integrate them um, is closely tied to a particular paradigm it seems more vulnerable because it can live and die on the success of that individual paradigm. So I think there's been some resistance to the model because it seems closely tied to a particular paradigm of, of quantum consciousness. From my side, I think it's valuable to explore what you're exploring. And yet in terms of the traction of the model, gaining wider acceptance, kind of speaking a language that can help it get into doors that would otherwise remain closed. Um, you know, Wilbur's model uh, speaks more, I could say, generically and allows it to have bigger traction. So is my, my question to you is, is there a way that you could frame your, your model or, or have you been working with that and framing your model where it's true to the insights of quantum consciousness, but it doesn't lead with that so that it can seem <laughs> you know, flexible and, and interfaceable with other paradigms as well that maybe can help it have more success um, in gaining acceptance in, in, in the kind of contemporary mainstream integral and related circles. Well, first of all, I think you totally nailed it about Ken. I really do. Uh, my take on that is that when Ken said what he said about, oh, was, the paper was called uh, Introducing the Apple Cube. And la later, he actually, because the uh, Apple Journal went defunct, he later uh, put it up on his um, uh, Integral Naked site, which was really kind of him to do that. But I think that um, Ken was very, very shrewd that he, uh, and correct, uh, that he wanted to keep the model uh, as simple as possible because um, the moment something gets too complicated, it's like uh, it generates less and less interest, right? And uh, so he kept it simple and he, uh, he kept the, the cube out of the picture, I think, for those reasons, you know. So, um, you know, it kind of left me holding the can. I, 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 I realized this a, a, a very, a lot earlier, you know, that Ken had done that. Uh, that's why, you know, it was hands off. Uh, and I, I respected it. So, you know, I was left holding the can and it was like, well, you know, do I just uh, go along with that and, uh, and you know accept it? And uh, it was almost like a, it wouldn't let go. It wouldn't let me go. The the um, the vertical axis injunction just kept coming back and back and back. And the most painful aspect of it uh, was to see all the dog uh, chasing tail arguments and discussions that would happen on the uh, integral arena. 
where because of the lack of, of, of a, 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 a more dimensional model, we were not allowed uh, to formulate reality. Uh, to a sufficient degree that it didn't become too paradoxical and, and, and confusing. So even without that third axis injunction, it created huge confusion. And I realized, well, okay, what's the lesser of the two evils that, you know? Uh, and I, and I, so I, I just realized now I got to carry on with this and, and uh, it, it will It'll stick where it'll stick and it'll drop where it'll drop, you know. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, the, and, and, and it continues to this day. And one of the most classic examples of the lack of um, a third axis injun injunction is the hard problem. The hard problem is, is iconic, you know what I mean? And when will the hard problem ever, ever get resolved kind of thing? But the only reason the hard problem exists is because um, awareness and energy uh, haven't yet been dimensionally differentiated. So that when you're talking about a dimensional situation in 3D, say, of you know, uh, a human being, sensory aware, cognitively adept, and that what's behind all this, is the brain capable of all of this? You know, it's only because uh, there's a, a lack of uh, dimension to that model that uh, gives you a 4D reality where we not only have a physical body, but we have an energy body. And that energy body is capable of ridiculous things that uh, a physical body totally is not. And they're both valid and they're both real and they're both um, necessary um, and they don't contradict each other. They, they, they support each other, uh, you know, uh, 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 into our slowly becoming a, a multidimensional being ourselves, you know. So um, I think it's just raising our vibration is the answer to that one, you know, gradually um, becoming more and more clear about who we are, what we are, you know. And it's time and it's just patience. And I used to be impatient and you, I know you two guys used to get really pissed off with me. <laughs> you know, remember the inter integral uh, square, town square, town, what was it, town square? Integral Town Square or something, that forum. <laughs> and I used to be banging away <laughs> about this goddamn Aquil Cube. <laughs> uh, there's, there's an interesting tension there between what's, like Bruce was saying, what's more um, generically accessible to people and then what's more specific and rich and complicated between the interface of a model and its comprehensiveness. You know, I know yeah. myself, you start, you get an idea and you, okay, I'm going to make a graph. And you're like, oh, I'm going to need a torus on this graph. And yeah, actually yeah. It, it would only work if the graph was rotating. <laughs> but at this point, first of all, I can't make this. And second of all, I've lost everyone. <laughs> but on the other hand, if I make a very accessible, simplified version, which they can get into, yeah. I'm, my heart's going to be like, ah, oh, I didn't even tell them the other six things. <laughs> So we've got to have people specializing in both of those tasks, I think, to get I know, it. I know. I, it's a learning curve. <laughs> you know. um, help. <laughs> uh, I, I'd sort of like to uh, probe your sense of what the what the field of meta thinkers is like. Obviously, you appreciate Wilbur's work. You you must appreciate Sean's work. But what's your sense of of the people thinking in these zones? Like what, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Like, uh, what are we good at right now? And what are we still weak on in terms of building up coherent meta models? Well, like I said earlier, I am no philosopher and you're trying to lead me down that philosophical path, aren't you? <laughs> and it's a <the> jungle. <laughs> so, I, I mean, uh, I really don't have any uh, high-flown... Uh, ideas about that, uh, but 
basically it's got to happen. I, I love it that it is happening. I love it that we can eat. There's even a terminology uh, for it, you know, uh, all the meta this and the meta that. Um, and uh, I feel that the more developed we become, the higher the frequency that we have, the more and more we feel feel comfortable in those worldviews. It is a, a worldview, I guess, the, the, the meta, the meta worldview. Is there a word for that? Uh, other than uh, cosmocentric? I don't know. But, but it's that emerging worldview that we need to arrive at, where all this language then becomes poetry and, you know, enjoyable for everybody. <laughs> Did I evade your question there? <laughs> that, that was good. I think we got it. <laughs> I mean, you did, you did, but you got to a good place with it. <laughs> Ken Wilber's work has notably gone through a number of different stages or phases, you know, Ken one through five. And you talked about pushing Ken Wilber's work into Wilber six um, with your model, but in observing your own writing over the last, you know, decade or more, I've also seen you kind of moving through different phases in your work, kind of taking it to the next level. Are you able to identify for yourself kind of the, the stage journey that you've taken over the last, you know, 10, 20 years in, in working on this? Well, I think that I, I have considerable more embarrassment about my earlier phases than Ken probably does about his. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I definitely have uh, gone through that. Uh, I mean, when I was doing the all persons work, you know, where each and each pers person perspective that we take is an octodynamic, right? Uh, I was just getting all fired up about what the implications of all of that and what the what this really means even in terms of being able to language consciously you know uh, rather than language subconsciously but um it was not until i became uh, more involved in the sciences because i came from a science source so in a way it was like natural for me to recurse back that I realized um, that that science was uh, was crippled uh, through um, uh, not differentiating the laws of physics dimensionally. I mean the laws of physics in 1D are hugely different from the laws of two quantum. And the laws of three, you know, uh, 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 atomic and molecular. Uh, and then the laws of four. Oh, my God, what are the laws of four? They are, they are totally off the wall. Nothing, almost nothing to do with three. How do those, those two connect, you know? But I realized that there had to be a language uh, created uh, that would... Uh, uh, that where we would end up with, um, you know, an integrated science, uh, multi-dimensional science. And that, I think that's really what got me into it. Ken's work was fundamental, pivotal, because in the integral relativity theory, the very first uh, tenet is the, the, equi the, the uh, energy awareness equivalence. And when I uh, wrote a paper on it, my argument was to try to show how there was a continuum uh, from the en uh, awareness energy equivalence to the energy mass equivalence, that it was just a continuum, uh, another octave, if you like, you know? And when I, when I sent that paper in, I, I 
didn't hear from them for five months. And I thought, shit, this isn't going to get published at all, right? Uh, and then uh, I, got, I got this letter saying, well, you know, uh, this pa paper has been all over the place. We've had so many uh, people trying to uh, validate your premise that, that this is, we're talking about a continuum here. Uh, and that's why it's taken so long. But in the end, we got a consensus that, that we agree with you that there could be a continuum. So we decided to publish, publish a paper. So um, that went through a, an excruciating peer review, <laughs> you know. And uh, it, it kind of encouraged me really to stick with it, you know, after that even though it's sort of uh, getting pretty wild, you know. I'm curious about, um, you know, the role of the subtle dimension in all this, because you mentioned things like Dean Radden, or you say we all have an energy body. There's people whose ears perk up. And there's other people who shut down completely when they hear that. And I've been a strong proponent of treating the state domains as more than just personal internal experiences, as, as fundamental dimensions of reality that have to be understood in a broader way. What, what's your take on the subtle? What is the subtle body? What is the subtle dimension? And how does it interface with the other aspects of your model? Wow, that is, um, yeah, that is the, the, the question of questions, really. Um, I mean, okay, when I was writing my book, uh, I got to the chapter uh, that where I wanted to talk about soul. And uh, I got in touch with Ken and uh, we had a whole discussion about it that went on and on and on. And eventually he got really mad with me. And um, because I said that soul goes all the way down as a, uh, as a, a dimension, a, a dimensional experience, you know, I mean, we leave the physical Body, we leave the physical world. Where do we go next? And uh, it's the soul, uh, uh, the subtle dimension that, okay, we hang there and then we can come back when we want to. And, uh, so if that was the case, so, uh, soul had to go all the way down, had to be full spectrum, just as uh, uh, evolutionary, with all the evolutionary potential that uh, a three-dimensional uh, universe has and a four-dimensional universe has. Um, so he said, no, soul does not go all the way down. It emerges. It emerges at a certain point, and what was that, indigo or something? And, 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 and then you, 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 you acquire this new dimension of, uh, of being through, through emergence as a result of your having gone through all these other developmental stages and frequencies. So I, uh, where he got mad with me and never spoke to me again after this was, uh, I said, well, there's a big difference between soul emerges into existence and soul emerges into our awareness. And I feel that your you've got those mixed up and it's really you're what you're really talking about soul emerging is it, uh, it's emerging into our awareness not into existence this already exists so that was that you wouldn't have anything more to do with me <laughs> but but the stacking problem you know of the of the uh, gross subtle causal thing again all that uh, goes away in a multi-dimensional model, you know, because they're not stacked. They're parallel universes, if you like, you know, not to confuse universe with the phys alternate physical universes, but dimensional universes, but parallel universes of uh, existence and experience. And uh, then you don't have a stacking problem because every one of those universes has its developmental trajectory and, and emergence, you know what I mean? Yeah, so that's a, a that's a, uh, how do I deal with that one? I, I know that I have not dealt with it very well. 
I really am aware of that. But it is, con it continues to be a confusing issue, doesn't it? Because now I never use the word subtle for uh, fundamental concrete energies, you know, because that, that's where the confusion comes in. The moment you say subtle energies and you're really talking about um, sub-quantum or quantum or 4D non-local, you know, uh, you, you're in, in deep shine out. I'm thinking here of some models, uh, possibly in uh, some Christian models, early you know desert Christians. There's multiple approaches where they consider that there are multiple souls, right? And it could be that you and Ken are looking at different souls in the sense in that in these models, there's one soul that's built up and gathered over time. It, it is developed and emergent, um, whereas there's others that are kind of inbuilt and fundamental. So, you know, that's a little metaphysical twist if you're going to play with that, that possibly there could be. Yeah, the Chinese are very into that, like uh, um, uh, even on the material plane where, where there are uh, ghosts. Uh, you know that hang around uh, and then disappear, or, uh, but uh, but basically uh, we're talking about uh, energies uh, associated with with oneself. So again, it's the awareness energy um, equivalents. I I feel that w what this is is that uh, as we're gradually evolving as a species, that interface between um, our energy body awareness and our physical body awareness is uh, becoming very transparent. And, uh, and it's not like suddenly, you know, like the guy who crawls through the uh, fabric of the universe and there's a whole other thing on the other side of it. You know, that old uh, medieval etching. Uh, it's not like, oh, yeah, but it's, it's more like it creeps up on us, I think, uh, that, that we become intuitively aware of, uh, uh, of our other um, dimensional existence. And the Chinese, with, the, with their incredible spiritual history, have probably just like uh, come back to that one again and again and again you know, through all the various masters uh, that culture's had. Um, I love that interview with uh, Lonnie that you did. It's just incredible. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. We got to some yeah. nice places there. Uh, yeah. Your thinking tracks, you know, structures and experiences of structures a lot. Right. It even comes up. I mean, those, you know, the, the two squares that make the cube are a little bit like that. And your discussion about um, talking to Ken around the soul is like that, where you feel like he was conflating the the awareness, the experience of the soul being there with the nature of the soul being there. And my question then is, what's what's added by that experience? You know, if you know, if you think about the thing Ken's talking about, about it. Come becoming part of our awareness, becoming part of our identity, uh, a process of the integration of these parallel universes or dimensions that's happening in the course of our lifetime. Does that just come apart? Does that continue? What does our life and our work add to this structure? Does that integration persist or do those dimensions just come apart? Is anything fundamentally changed by us becoming aware and by the docking together of these different dimensions. Wow. Our, our history uh, um, definitely seems to recapitulate that one. Uh, I mean, it comes up time and time again in various cultures, you know. Uh, uh, so there's, there must be some incredible profundity to it. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's in a way, it's kind of a, 
uh, a mind f that these earlier cultures can be talking about such uh, sophisticated levels of, of awareness when they're supposed to be uh, red and purple and beige, you know what I mean? Uh, it, it's it's uh, almost, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. But uh, 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 to me, on the dimensional uh, chart, you know, where you've got dim each dimension is going through that process, uh, gi giving access through all those levels. Uh, what it simply means is that um, a, a 3D historical culture firmly embedded in red in the cognitive spectrum uh, still has access to um, same level experience in, uh, in other higher dimensions. And we, we keep popping in and out of them. And, so, and, and that has been a historical narrative uh, of our uh, development, hasn't it? That we've always had access. It's just a matter of, you know, on the Wilbur Coombs thing, uh, uh, what's your experience of the access? But it's still access, you know. Uh, as we're evolving, like the COVID thing, I feel is, is a blessing in disguise because it's, it's, it's just um, uh, changing uh, and accelerating um, our self-awareness, in, in my opinion, you know, even just like at home here, you know, you can see the effect it has. And um, I don't think it's going to be very long, I really don't, before as a, a, a global culture, you know, we're, we're going to be very cognizant of who we are as say a soul you know you know oh, you know this is a really interesting um like parallel you know wormholes so we're back to physics wormholes great idea and and maybe more than that great uh, reality you know, if it pans out and uh, wow, watch out, you know, <laughs> suddenly zapping off to other uh, galaxies and stuff. Uh, but the, the wormhole thing uh, is also uh, um, an interior thing because, you know, uh, when you, uh, when you, I bet you, you are really familiar with this. When you, you're elevating your frequency, uh, one thing that uh, often pops up for me uh, is a, a tunnel, a huge thing, you know, it just starts to grow and it, it gets scary because it's, it's, it just seems so damn big. Uh, on the other hand, it could be uh, like a pinhole, you know, <laughs> but, but the way we see it, it's just like uh, you, you going into this uh, thing and sometimes too fast to be comfortable. Uh, but it, 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 it is a wormhole, as far as I'm concerned. It's just a, 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 an interior view uh, a, 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 of, a, of a wormhole. Uh, interior meaning our interior, you know, rather than a, you know, looking at it in, in a quantum sense, you know. So that everything's like merging, isn't it, really? To take this even further out there, I think I can relate to your discussion of the the wormhole through a number of experiences, but one of them was a type of lucid dream in which a llama, you know, Tibetan llama, leapt on top of my body, pinned me to the ground, and oh took, took me through death. He just, you know, told me it's time to it's time to let go into death, and there was a an incredible rushing through a tunnel, a kind of wind-like sound, and then suddenly an emergence into an entirely different kind of causal space. And so there's, for me, there's a number of things that you're talking about that track very well with contemplative traditions, with, say, distinctions between Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya, that kind of thinking and, and world space, I, I imagine, 
you know, and especially in integral post metaphysical world space and in and, and some of the audience that we're going to have watching this, even sympathetic people like Greg Henriquez, who's trying to imagine big history um, with multiple layers. Some dimensions of this are going to be too boggling, right? You know, if, if people have a contemplative experience, they can find dimensions that resonate. Um, for those who are uh, having a hard time <laughs> with this on the science side, on the empirical side, who would you recommend people look at to get a sense of, of what kind of grounded empirical studies are happening um, that corroborate some of these kinds of distinctions? Uh, Dean Radin's uh, Real Magic uh, is such an easy read. Uh, he's such a, a dedicated uh, empiricist How about that uh, in a, a, a noetic uh, arena. Uh, you got to love the guy, you know, um, and uh, uh, he, he's... Um, it's not so much about his own personal experiences. It's about the uh, his lab rats, you know, <laughs> these people who um, are definitely coming from higher frequencies. And he and he says, you know, these are the best results. I I just look for these people because uh, they they give me the best results, you know. And uh, and it, and some bits um, phenomenological, you know, where they're relating their experiences. Um, under certain conditions, but uh, but some of it is um, downright borderline uh, trends. You know, beyond the normal, paranormal. Okay, right, paranormal. And he deals with these people. So, and he and he has the worst time of anybody. Because of this, it's so like in your face, you know. But um, but because he he uh, he does he he is so relatable, I would point any anyone to Dean's work uh, first. Yeah, I really would. Is there anyone else? Pim Van Lommel, who uh, he. Uh, as a cardiologist in Amsterdam, he used to experience um, a lot of uh, deaths on his slab, uh, and and a few of them came back, and uh, and it really um, uh, really uh, changed his life. You know, and he started go uh, forget the surgeries anymore. He just started to get into that alone. Grayson in um, University of Virginia. He is uh, brilliant at setting up experiments to uh, basically show afterlife uh, possibilities uh, of, you know, uh, under excruciating um, empirical protocols uh, of uh, his subjects uh, with their afterlife uh, memories and stuff, you know. Uh, screening out all the people who uh, in this lifetime have never been to the location where they said they were located in a previous life, that kind of thing. You know, all these empirical protocols that you just can't get away from, multiple blind things uh, of uh, basically proving to anybody who reads their work, oh, my God, you know, there really, there really is reincarnation, <laughs> you know. All that kind of thing. Um, Grayson, Van Lommel, and Dean, right? Those are the three I would zoom for. The, uh, the wormhole discussion, it's got me, it's, it's put an odd sequence of associations in my mind. I first started <laughs> thinking about it. Uh, my body is full of tingles when I check. And if I feel more carefully to those tingles, it does feel like they're not just hanging out, they're zooming somewhere. <laughs> and if I look too closely, I fall into that zooming. And this makes me think of Star Trek with its wormholes and its warp drive. Yeah. And that reminds me of the fact that watching the movie Star Trek II when I was a kid was the first time I ever thought about dimensions. 
There's a sequence where Kirk and Khan are faced off inside a cloud and they're fighting and Khan is a better strategist, but Kirk goes underneath and comes up behind him. And when I was a kid, I was like, oh, is that what a genius is? Someone who thinks we're the next <laughs> dimension. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see that changed your life right there it changed my life I, i'm wondering <laughs> you could uh walk us through your notion of what you mean when you talk about dimensions because it's not necessarily the same as what everybody means when they say dimensions so yes, for people exactly. who are watching this just for like zero one two three four what yep. are those dimensions for yep, you yeah yeah yep, yep. uh so you know uh it's it's a language um, that uh, has um, is used in different ways. You're dead right, and some people talk about five D and they mean one thing. Other people talk about five D and they mean another. And uh, so, rather than uh, try to wrangle uh, with all of that, I uh, I I stick to uh, the scientific protocols. So if you're dealing with uh, the zero point field scientifically, you know, you're actually trying to um, get readings on what this field is, right? Then that's my definition of zero. If you're uh, trying to spot the first visible signs of activity coming out of that zero. Uh, these actual visible things are called fluctuons. Uh, it's almost like Brownian motion, you know, uh, on an atomic level, on a molecular atomic level, Brownian motion is like uh, the, the jostling of these uh, uh, things, uh, just uh, in perpetual motion, you know. It's the same thing exactly with, uh, uh, with the subatomic uh, field. Uh, it's, it's in that same uh, perpetual flux caused by wave uh, motion. And um, so if you're dealing with uh, phenomena that are related to that, then that's my definition of 1D. And then if you go into all the um, uh, structures that emerge out of that dimension into uh, 2D, where now you're really talking about form, fundamental forms uh, uh, relating to each other and getting together and figuring things out, uh, then I call that uh, 2D. And, and that's my scientific uh, you know, bottom line on that. And the same with 3D, uh, where you're talking about Einstein, uh, Newtonian physics. That's my bottom line for 3D. My bottom line for 4D is Bohmian uh, physics, which uh, um, uh, has uncovered all these crazy things like longitudinal and latitudinal waves that are capable of infinite velocities uh, nothing to do with the speed of light anymore. You know, we're not in Kansas anymore, you know. Um, that's my uh, bottom line for 40. Uh, a scientific, you know, protocol, right? So moving on to 5D, yeah, I've heard of lots of 5Ds and it's very popular new age thing too, you know. 5D experience, this is so 5D but uh, it's uh, work that's being done by people like Gary Schwartz, Pim, uh, Pim van Lommel, researchers dealing with uh, afterlife and reincarnation. Uh, that's my bottom line for uh, the subtle existence, truly subtle. So, but as, again, a scientific protocol there, see? And, and then, uh, wow, you, you get up to 60 causal reality. Well, who the heck knows about causal reality and who's dealing with it scientifically? And it's like, I, I, just, I, I laughed so hard when I realized that, the, the, that this was actually true, that the, the Dalai Lama had uh, lined up his best meditators uh, to come up with um, like a, 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 a 
full disclosure thing of what the heck's happening in causal reality, you know, comparing notes, just like the old Rishis in their caves, you know, 5,000 years ago, comparing notes and, and, uh, and uh, doing the causal science, you know. I, I can't argue with that. <laughs> so that's my bottom line for 60, good old Dalai Lama, <laughs> and maybe a few others, you know. <laughs> so yeah, uh, uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, the, uh, I mean, geometry has been behind, I think, a lot of uh, dimensional talk, you know, uh, uh, 5D geometry, you know, that kind of thing, uh, which has really got nothing to do with subtle reality. It's got more to do with um, spatial temporal relationships that, uh, that are uh, not as um, obvious as uh, the eye may, may perceive, you know. But nevertheless, you know, still dealing with physical reality. So yeah, I, I try to differentiate that very clearly. Speaking of layman's uh, inner tingles that are zooming, I call that the champagne body. Oh, yes. <laughs> Man, oh, that is it, Bruce. I love that. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, there's definitely, a, there's definitely a level of champagne body. I haven't seen people talk about that enough. <laughs> so, so layman, uh, uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit more about your champagne body, will you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, when I was in elementary school, we had a substitute music teacher one week. And he had all these games for us to play. And at the end of every session, he would make us lie down and do a relaxation exercise. And he would say, put your toes to sleep and put your feet to sleep. And I was a kind of like, I don't know what he's talking about. What does he mean <laughs> to sleep? And I would try to do something and it would tingle. <laughs> and at the end, I don't know if I was relaxed. I certainly wasn't asleep, but my whole body was tingling. And I thought it was so odd. I decided I would get better at it. Right. Because at first I was slow counting to 10. I thought I should be able to do this in a few seconds or even one second. So I just worked on this as I was a kid because it felt neat and it reminded me of science fiction movies that I liked. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then later in life, I started to feel it was really important to walk around in your champagne body and like teach it to have experiences wow, and evolve wow, through wow, the counters. Wow. Wow. And now it's just a pretty steady part of my experience. Well, you are very bubbly. Oh, thank you. Nice of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> so were, were you going to go somewhere with a question there, Bruce? Yeah, not directly from that. I was also thinking, just as a point of curiosity, which might not go anywhere. So I have two questions because one of them might not go anywhere. But uh, what's your level of familiarity with Herbert Gunther, uh, especially his book, uh, Matrix of Mystery, and uh, how he interfaces uh you know thermodynamic models and quantum models with uh pretty deep esoteric uh buddhist zogchen uh and and you know higher tantra models uh, well uh, actually not at all but uh, uh i want you to uh, tell me something right now about uh, what uh, what it is that uh, you've seen there he does uh, a number of things. Um, the main thing that he's doing is really kind of combining Heideggerian language about being and kind of post-metaphysical takes on, on being and, and presencing and different layers of that um, with thermodynamic models. Uh, he talks about being, say, you know, systems being far from equilibrium and, uh, at certain bifurcation points, they can leap up to different levels of organization. Yeah, yeah. And he sees meditative disciplines as taking you farther from equilibrium into those points of kind of liminal chaos that allow for a leap and a reorganization of the system at higher levels. But he talks uh, he use, he makes different appeals to the quantum models and talks about, you know, in Dzogchen, they have very fundamental points of 
awareness, which he kind of tracks and maps with, with quantum models in wow. terms of, yeah. So I think you'll find it resonant if you haven't come across this work. You will go there. Yeah. It's, that sounds right up my street. Uh, it reminds me of, um, uh, you know, the th uh, in thermodynamics where, uh, in fact, you know, back, back to the bottom of the sea in these volcanic vents, right? Uh, now, why, why was life so, is life so prolific uh, around these vents, you know? Well, it's really all about uh, energy and how to deal with it, you know? Um, uh, and, uh, and I feel that um, energy as a co-equal uh, of awareness uh, has its agenda as well as awareness. You know, uh, it, and one of those agendas is to deal, uh, w uh, dissipate and, and, and uh, spread the energy around, you know, don't keep it localized, get, get it out there, you know, and um, uh, in, therm uh, in thermodynamics, this uh, uh, life is actually one of those perfect answers to uh, en entropic problems, you know. Get, uh, get rid of the entropy. Yeah, uh, bring it. Let's get an organism in here. And they'll, they'll do it like you wouldn't believe, you know. Uh, uh, just a fundamental energy problem and how, how to, uh, you know, neutralize it uh, entropically. And uh, suddenly you've got all this prolific life. So there's a very fine, there's a very fuzzy line between energy and, and awareness, I feel, you know, uh, because they're, 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 they're like two sides of the same coin, you know. Now, in these vents, let's try to imagine that instead of having uh, living organisms, how would non-living structures deal with the same problem? And the answer is really, they, they can't, they won't. Because what, what happens is that uh, you just uh, get a, an accretion uh, that builds and builds and builds until it blocks the vent and the vent, then the, then the vent doesn't exist anymore and another vent pops up some, somewhere else. But the moment life is involved in, in, uh, in these, uh, with these vents, uh, they, they don't get blocked, they just keep, venting and life keeps propagating so there's a wonderful harmony between awareness and energy as opposed to just energy and and just a uh, entropic system L life brings in in uh, negative entropy into it uh, and, uh, and uh, it makes you wonder if in fact there's a beautiful balance throughout the whole cosmos between, you know, the entropic aspect and the negentropic aspect, because of the awareness energy equivalence in all these different scales, scale invariant, you know. So your um, those dimensions you talked us through are different. Um, different complexities of how something that is simultaneously awareness and energy can show up. It's showing up in all these different ways, but in all these different ways, they're always together. Yeah. Now I'm a, I mean, some people, when they imagine awareness going all the way down, they think of human awareness going all the way down. Sometimes they think yeah. of just an, an invisible witnessing power. Uh, I'm a fan of Nietzsche and Nietzsche tried to describe it as intentionality, right? He said that, what he called the will to power is kind of impulse that yeah. subjectively goes along with energy dynamics at their lowest level. But his understanding of physics came from 1860. <laughs> so when you look at physics now, how would you tend to characterize the, the lowest levels of subjectivity and intentionality? What's a, what's a good way of describing that? What is it up to? What are, what are wants and experiences and awarenesses at that scale? Yeah, at the at the very um, uh, lowest scales, I think a good um, a good way to look at it is Ken's four quadrant map, 
because when you when you look at the zero point, you know um, what the heck is going on there? You know, now the map self evidently tells us that there's awareness going on there, as well as energy. Uh, uh, the left hand quadrants are coming out of there, and the right hand quadrants are coming out of there, and they're both coming out of there together. You know. Uh, so right there, uh, you have the uh, awareness energy equivalence uh, at all, all scales. Ken admitted that his uh, four quadrants map is really um, a, 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 a physical third person map, you know. So that's fine. Physical third person map, that works. And it does. It's good for this physical cosmos. It's no good for any other dimension but 3D. For instance, it's not really great at 2D either, which is why your question came out because the map doesn't really show what's going on in 2D, does it? And it certainly doesn't show what's going on in 1D. But um, what is going on at 1D is that wave formations are in 1D, looking at the fluctuons, the behavior of them, they are very, as it were, uh, individual. Uh, they're individual, they're seemingly random formations, and, but they are very individual. But the moment you go from 1D to 2D, you go into a field so suddenly the individual becomes a second person, as it were. Uh, it's now in relationship. Uh, uh, and that relationship is called a field. And field a activity at that level uh, is, um, it almost seems sentient uh, uh, that uh, er uh, there's a huge amount of organization and behavior um, and I feel that, yeah, at those scales, the, there is not a real separation between awareness per se and energy per se, uh, because the wave function at that level is, um, is uh, so minimal. But the moment you expand the differentiations become clearer and clearer and clearer that there's something else going on. Now, when Penrose was looking at the spinners, they actually convinced him that these things were aware uh, because uh, of, of the way how they behaved. And now I wouldn't argue with him personally, but I, I think that he probably had um, some experiences that really made that seem very obvious to him. Um, but you can't look at uh, anthropolize it, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and talk about awareness on those levels, You're trying to think, yeah, the, the aware universe, right? So there's this big anthropomorphic being, you know, that is the universe. Uh, I mean, this is the classic sort of God uh, on a cloud thing with a beard, isn't it? It's the same kind of thing. And we can't do that. I'm I'm intrigued by this, uh, you know, the individuality of one D and the relationality of two D. Yeah, it reminds me of the Fourier transform, which has a ro big role for Bohm and a big role in quantum mechanics because you can take structures that appear in physical fields and decompose them into an infinite number of sine waves, but those sine waves they don't really interact with each other. When they interact together, then we have the basic level of the physical universe. But when we just consider them as waves, they pass through each other like they don't even touch each other. Yes. So there is this real independence, this real yes, individuality exactly. there. Yeah. Well, th this is it. I, I'm, uh, I'm writing a paper right now about uh, Le Fo uh, uh, Fourier and uh, Laplace uh, transformations in the... Uh, the um, structure of uh, uh, fundamental structures of waves, waveform, you know, because um, 
you know, I really want to take this all the way to the crosshairs. I want to go, is there a black hole in the Ken's crosshairs? <laughs> crosshairs? I don't know. But I want to go down it, you know. Um, so anyway, uh, there is, um, there is um, a real uh, feeling of, well, you know what? Uh, you're going to be shocked when I tell you this. Uh, I'm, prob I'm, I'm probably going to get trashed when I say this, okay? But you know when uh, uh, you and I were just saying, yeah, the uh, waves seem to have this individual autonomy thing, but then you take it to the next level and they're now fields working in uh, harmony with each other. Um, well, see, I feel that there's a correspondence, and I didn't say synonymity, but it just a correspondence, but maybe there isn't a synonymity uh, between first person, second person, third person, first dimension, second dimension, third dimension. Because if awareness goes all the way down, as well as energy, then where do the persons begin? Two, how do the persons emerge? At that level. Now, the usual human model is that, yeah, if, uh, your first person awareness emerges at this age, uh, you know, uh, you, you become obsessed, you know, with uh, food, your, the milk that has to be there, and boom. Uh, and, uh, and then the second person is when you realize where the milk's coming from and you start uh, bonding with your mom, you know, and then uh, even later than that, uh, our sense of third person emerges, right? I have a feeling that um, these are dimensional ghosts, uh, that they're really happening dimensionally uh, as well, you know, doppelgangers as it were. First dimension, first person, second dimension, second person, fields relating, third person. And, uh, and now you're getting a more objective view of reality. And sure enough, we're, we're in this object. <laughs> you get my drift. And I'm just wondering if there, if there is a, that, a, a real correspondence there between our persons and our dimensions. Interesting question. Along these lines, uh, David Bohm famously said at one point that the, the more he studied reality at the quantum and, and cosmic levels, the more he found the universe to function like a thought than a machine. And he wasn't asserting that the universe is a big conscious human or um, something like that. But, you know, he, he talks in a lot of ways about correspondences between quantum behavior and the way actually thinking, you know, and awareness behave if you observe them uh, you know, with uh, quantum uncertainty and, and, and different kinds of dynamics. Um, he, he finds the same thing in thought. And I, I believe it was in another discussion. I don't remember if it was part of our meta model series or another discussion, but I, brought up his uh, model of soma significance and signosomatics. And he's only had, I think, one paper about that. Um, but are you familiar with that? And where he, he basically creates a triangulation among yes. energy and meaning or significance and form. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, I think that uh, bef just before he died, he was really uh, getting somewhere with that. And uh, it, it was kind of uh, making what few hairs I got left up here stand on end because uh, I felt that he was actually uh, uh, approaching um, integral relativity, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a full-fledged way, you know, like it should and could have done. Uh, I mean, integral relativity really should have come out with um, the early greats, you know, Planck and all that cluster that came with Planck. Integral relativity could and should 
have emerged there as a full-fledged being, you know. But he was, uh, I felt that he was, his trajectory was uh, headed there. And what happened on the uh, day he died, he was in Burbeck, one of the London University colleges, which funnily enough is just down the road from uh, my university college. He's in Burbeck uh, one day, the end of the day, and he uh, called his wife uh, and told her he'd be coming home soon. And his last words to his wife were, I think I'm on the edge of something big. And my fantasy is that he was onto integral relativity as a continuum, you know, a true continuum of mass energy awareness, you know. Just relativity. Relativity has these two sort of um, senses for people. One is just that everybody has different values and perspectives. And the other one is the Einsteinian thing where we can calculate things relative to other things. So uh, do you think one of the reasons that Planck and the boys and Bohm didn't get onto an integral relativity earlier is that people have a reluctance to quantify these other dimensions? And that if we don't quantify them, we can't cross calculate them and we can't have a coherent relativity. I think you nailed it. You nailed it. Yeah. I think that, that, and there's a lot of uh, built in prejudice there too, you know, like, um, you know, the, the competition, you know, you, you say a, a, a wrong thing and you, your career is trashed, you know what I mean? But, um, but they were all onto the same thing. This is the irony wasn't it? You know, the, there's hardly any one of those guys wasn't talking about consciousness and, uh, you know, aware universes and, and all this kind of thing. Uh, I, as far as the general public's concerned, I think there's a confusion between rena- relationality and relativity, you know, whereas objects are relational, you know, even atoms, Uh, they affect each other. Relativity is uh, is more of a both and thing where they're not only uh, relating to each other, but they also have their own realities that are relative depending on what dimension you're in if you like or uh or uh you know with the uh with einstein it was the um doppler effect right somebody on the platform somebody on the train you know two uh relative experiences not relational but relative so relative realities in other words are not contradictive I, I got I got that flag actually when I when I first um, put relativity into the title of my paper, and somebody was saying, "Well, yeah, but you you're just trying to get on the coattails of you know who, and and uh, you're not really talking about relativity theory at all. You're talking about uh, you know the, re- the relationships between you know uh, one uh, states relationships between states." And the moment he said that, I knew I was right because I wasn't actually talking about a relationship between states. You know what I mean? But it's a, it's a tricky one that for people to understand. God, I wish Bohm hadn't died. I really do. When he did, you know, I wish he'd just got home and told his wife. You know? <laughs> ah, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's frustrating. <laughs> well, I think we're probably getting close to our time here, and I wanted to ask you, um, what have we failed to ask you, and, and Layman might have a similar kind of question, but what have we failed to ask you about your, your model or your approach that you really feel like is important to get out and for people to understand? Well, you, you've asked me all the embarrassing questions, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, You know, uh, I think that um, what integrals um, probably have the most trouble with in terms of uh, all persons 
Aqual, AP Aqual, and all dimensions Aqual, AD Aqual, is that um, they can't see an, any uh, application. It's uh, like a big so what, you know. We 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 can apply Ken's thing. We don't we don't need all that other stuff, you know. What do you need it for, right? Uh, and the honest answer to that is that I'm not really sure, but uh, all I know is that it's there. You know, the most I think one of the most profound experiences that I had um, in developing this model was in the very early days when I realized what this uh, structure was behind the pronouns. Uh, there's a, a subjective, objective, singular, singular and, and uh, collective, right? Then uh, there's the vertical axis is um, tangible and intangible. Those, those aren't the actual words that you use for pronouns. Um, but but the tangible pronouns uh, are you know on the bottom uh, of the axis and the intangibles are uh, on on the top. So the the that uh, triaxial dynamic, I it was when I realised that the, um, the the all the personal pronouns in uh, in all persons uh, were generated by that. Um, uh, diagram that formula and i i realize wow uh what that means is that uh, we you know say as human beings when we uh create language we're subconsciously differentiating ourselves into these uh perspectives we haven't necessarily nail uh, you know labeled them right but even subconsciously, we've already started to do that because uh, because this is how this is the only way we can construct reality. The only way we construct reality is realizing that we have an inside, and there's an outside out there. And I, either I'm on my own or I'm with uh, lots of others, uh, and uh, I'm either relating to my experience. But then I know that there's something looking at that that is probably the real me, the, 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 the thing that's relating to my experience. You know, my experience is through my body and all my senses. It's telling me this, it's telling me that, but there's something else that's actually looking at it all and saying, yeah, uh, this is who you are. This is what you are. Um, I realized that, um, that, that that was probably a, a fractal uh, of, um, of the cosmic structure, you know. And the more I go into it, the more it seems that way. If we give ourselves permission to say things like all natural languages include subjective and objective and singular and plural phrases, then we can equally say that all natural languages include references to substantial and insubstantial aspects of being and a gradient or dialectic between them. Yeah, yeah. Now, my uh, here's my closing question. When you talk about spiritual practice, you tend to describe it as raising vibrations. And if you're anything like the other people we've talked to in the Meta Model series, that happens to you when you see or realize a new set of structures. <laughs> it's right. It's a very, it's a very powerful, very profound moment when you see something new in that pattern. Like a, a new worldview. Yeah. So my question is, is there any way to decide between, on the one hand, thinking that the convergence of those variables Make, you know, bringing a lot of things together in a new pattern produces the higher vibration or that simply going up in the vibration opens you to see existing pattern structures. Is there any way to adjudicate between those? Are they always together? Is it one or the yeah. other? It's called a toroidal um, recursion of information. It's almost like um, 
uh, Ken says, uh, you know, uh, it's all perspectives taking perspectives, right? You know, well, I mean, if you if you look at the eight, uh, eight fundamental perspectives, right? And there's one perspective that you've decided is going to take a, a, a perspective of another perspective. You end up with a total uh, recombination of 64 perspectives, just like the I Ching from, from the uh, uh, eight trigrams to the 64 hexagrams. Uh, you look at your first person perspectives and one is taking perspective of another. So in other words, like it's not, uh, to, to say we have perspectives is only half the story because really what is going on is that we have binary perspectives. We're, we're always taking one perspective of another. You know what I mean? It, it, it's always a subject and an object, right? So it's called uh, toroidal recursion of information. And the, to the torus uh, is, is another fractal structure uh, that you'll find at the heart of an atom and uh, at the heart of an entire universe. You know what I'm saying? And that's why I feel that the aqual cube, for instance, is not a cube, it's a torus. You know, it's just um, uh, 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 an, uh, an information recursor, really. <laughs> but it does have a central axis, aha, where is the central axis? We I think the that. phrase, the cube isn't really a cube, it's a torus, is a suitably <laughs> ambiguous and cryptic place to bring this to an end. <laughs> I've had a great time, Lex, and uh, I want to say I think this really humanizes a lot of your writings and diagrams. I'd also like to say that I love Bruce's uh, unbuttoned, low-cut look. Like he's a swinger. <laughs> I've enjoyed the champagne and donuts this morning. Oh, yes. I, I think I'll have champagne experience right now, layman. <laughs> I was looking at your charts and you were talking about non-differentiated and differentiated is maybe one of the distinctions. Um, you were also talking about identity, the intersection of identity, meaning, and location as some of the axes around which, you know, we dance with our uh, donuts and, and champagne. So um, anyway, really enjoyed this conversation with you also. It's, it's been, I think, lively and enlivening. And I, I think I'm, I'm hoping it will be a good introduction or deepening um, into your work for, for our viewers. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Layman. Uh, I've really enjoyed this too. And I, I, I find it very hard to understand how come, you know, I've never actually been with you in person ever before, but uh, this is a wonderful beginning. Thank you so much. Thank you.